All right. Well, uh, good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this class, uh, which is a, a class on the history of British India. My name is uh, uh, Vinay Lal, and uh, I'm pleased to have you uh, in this uh, course. Uh, what I want to do uh, today is to, we're going to have a full lecture today. Uh, I want to begin with some uh, preliminary remarks on uh, sort of administrative matters having to do with this course, the requirements, readings, so forth and so on. Uh, then I'm going to sort of give you a bit of a lecture on uh, what does it mean to study uh, British India? Why should we be bothered with British India at all? Uh, and what are the kinds of questions that come up in the study, not just of the history of British India, but in the study of history per se? And then finally, in the latter half of the course, I'm going to go through the syllabus carefully, uh, tell you what you should expect every week. I hope all of you have had a chance to look at the syllabus because it's you know, quite comprehensive. Everything is laid down, I think, very clearly and what you're expected to do for each week. So that's more or less how we're going to proceed today. Now, uh, let me begin with some uh, administrative matters. And let me also remind you that you should have your cell phones switched off preferably, not just in the silent mode, because some of you are going to try to do texting or whatever it is, Googling. If you can avoid doing that, I would really much prefer that, because it's distracting not just to you, but to me. All right? Uh, I've never had a problem with that in any class, and I certainly expect that that's how it's going to be in this class as well. Secondly, for those of you who are on the wait list, uh, all you have to do is just wait a couple of weeks. I mean, I can guarantee everybody a spot in the class if you happen to be on the wait list. But just wait until things settle down. You know, a couple of weeks, things will settle down. There may be a few people who might leave, a few people who might come. Uh, and if you find that at the end of the second week, you're still on the wait list, all you have to do is come to me and I'll give you a PT number and you'll automatically get into the class. I also want to mention to you that there is a, another course uh, which I'm teaching for the first time, which is a course that complements this class. Um, and this is not a recommendation for you to take that course. I'm simply mentioning it to you because that's a seminar. Unlike this class, which, which is a lecture course, it's a 97N in the Department of History. And it's called The History of Modern India and the Burden of Colonialism. Uh, and for those of you who are thinking about a seminar, that's a course that you might want to think about because what it's going to do is it's going to complement this course completely. There are few readings that overlap between this course and that course, but very few. But the bulk of that material will be pertaining to British India as well. Although, as I said, you know, the vast number of readings that you have are quite different in both of the courses that we that, that I'm talking about. But it, it's, it would be a good complement to this course if anyone is interested at all. And finally, I want to mention that there's a website I have, which uh, is called Manas. Uh, that's the URL over there. And this is a website that I had put up uh, about 15 years ago. So that was in the relatively early days of you know, the World Wide Web. Um, yeah. And it was put up explicitly for pedagogic purposes. It was put up basically to complement the courses that I was teaching. The, the website is not updated that often. In fact, I think the last time it was updated was probably two, three years ago. So I think that uh, when I say not that often, I'm, uh, I should probably say it's not updated at all, actually. Um, but uh, you will find about four or 500 articles on it, all of them written by myself. Um, and a good number of the articles have to do with the history of British India, close to 100 pieces. So there may be things that I might be saying in class which I'm not able to explain at very great length, and you'll be able to get a bit more information on this particular website. Okay? Uh, and it is a, a website that is actually hosted by UCLA because actually it was set up with an instructional improvement grant 15 or you know, maybe even 18 years ago. All right, now uh, this class is uh, a class that does not require any prerequisites. I want to make that very clear. Uh, I don't expect you to have any previous knowledge of Indian history. But just out of curiosity, I want to know how many of you have ever had a class in college at UCLA or elsewhere if you happen to be a transfer student 
in Indian history. Like Sorry? Like segments of Indian history. Not... Yeah, I mean, any, any portion of Indian history, you know, anything. So, I mean, about uh, 15 or 20 of you. And how many of you had a class with me? Um, so, okay, about two or three of you. All right. So, uh, so, as I said, I mean, I'm going to proceed on the assumption that you really know nothing about Indian history. It's a tabula rasa, as I say, a blank slate. Um, but, if, but, of course, you, there are things that you will have to pick up on your own. I mean, so I'm not obviously going to give you, you know, a rudimentary lecture on the geography of India, the fact that India is a peninsula, uh, and it's surrounded by water on three sides. To the east is the Bay of Bengal, to the west is the Arabian Sea, to the south is the Indian Ocean, and then if you go up north, uh, it's landlocked because you get the Himalayan range, right? Uh, and in fact, that's actually somewhat important. It's somewhat important because we're looking at the history of British India, and one question that we could ask is, well, how did the British arrive in India? Unlike, for example, the Mughals, uh, or let's say the Afghans, who came to India, you know, 1100, 1200, 1300, right? Or Alexander the Great, who came to India, 330 BCE, circa, approximately, right? Uh, I mean, they all came by land. The British didn't come by land. They came by sea. And the British were, in fact, a great maritime power. So this is where knowing even the rudimentary aspects of the geography of India, right, is important. It has some relevance. And so therefore, what you ought to be doing is that, you know, when something, of, something is assumed, and there are some things that are going to be assumed, even though I'm going to teach this course on the assumption that you have no previous knowledge of Indian history, but there are some things that are just too rudimentary for me to be able to explain in class, right? Um, and this is why I think it would be helpful if you just picked up, you know, in your leisure time, uh, let's say, you know, uh, some kind of history of India, or spend a little bit of time on Manas, where you'll get actually quite a bit of information on the course of Indian history over a very long period of time, so forth and so on. All right? Now, uh, uh, as far as the requirements for the class are concerned, they are stipulated in the syllabus very clearly. So there are basically three requirements. Well, I should say, formally speaking, two requirements. Right? So the two formal requirements are a midterm exam, uh, which is going to be a take-home exam. So I've, I've made it easy for you, really, in a way, because I, I think if you've kept up at the lectures, if you haven't, well, then be prepared to, you know, spend a, f uh, a couple of sleepless nights or, you know, uh, because I, I've been a student myself. I mean, I know the nature of student life. Not everybody's going to keep up with all the lectures. You've got other things in life to do and other interests and so forth and so on. But when you get the midterm exam, well, you'll have to answer the questions, and you'll have 48 hours, effectively, to do that. So it's going to be handed to you after class. It'll probably be just emailed to you after class. Uh, and I think the dates are stipulated, but I think it's October 29th, which is a Tuesday. And then you'll give me back a, a hard copy, a printed copy, in class on October 31st, which is a Thursday. So that's what I said. Effectively, you have about 48 hours, 46 hours, something like that. All right. And uh, what's the nature of the midterm exam? It's going to cover everything uh, up till October 29th. Right? And you will get, most likely, I haven't decided the exact format, but generally the way the midterm exam is structured, it's quite similar to how the final exam is going to be structured. But let me dispense with the midterm exam. So you'll probably get three questions. And you'll have to answer two out of those three questions. And you write essentially two to three pages on each of those two questions. So you'll give me a, um, you know, an exam back which is going to be a four to six pages in length. Uh, I have specified, please use Times New Roman 12. Do not use Courier. Do not use one of those fonts which swallows up the page, so to speak. Okay? If you use Courier, well, Courier three pages is equal to two pages of Times New Roman. Right? So, you know, we, we want to adhere to certain minimum standards here. Uh, and this, there are certain standard academic fonts. So use Times New Roman 12, okay, and give me a printout two days later in class. Now, the final exam, you're responsible for everything on the syllabus, including material covered in the first half of the course. And, of course, there will be some questions on the final exam which will be tailored more to the second half of the course, but then there'll be some questions which will 
cover the entire terrain from the outset. And the structure of the final exam is, it's again a take-home exam, okay? And you have one week to write that exam, which I think is very generous, frankly. One week is ample period of time to finish a final exam. Now the format of that exam is somewhat similar. So what you get is you get six questions, and you have to answer four of those six questions. But those six questions are divided into three groups. So group one, two, and three. Each group has two questions. Group one has two questions, and you do not get any choice there. You have to answer both of those questions. And those are those two questions that are going to c cover everything. Okay? So, you know, that's, uh, so there'll be a question which will, which will have, make you reflect on everything you've learned from the beginning until the end. Okay? And then groups two and three, each of those two groups will have two questions each, and you'll answer one out of two questions from each of those two groups. So you'll answer three questions, possibly four. But then if you, it's, sorry, four. So it's two from the first group, one from group two, and one from group three. So that's four out of six questions. That's what you'll answer at the final exam. Okay, and once again, a take-home final exam, and you've got about a week to write that exam. Right? So those are the, those are the formal requirements. Now, you know, if you look at the syllabus, it sort of gives you the breakdown of what percentage of your grade uh, is covered by the final exam and the midterm. The final exam accounts for 55%, the midterm 35%, well that's 90%, and 10% is essentially class attendance and participation. Very, sometimes I get students asking me, well what does that really mean? Because I don't obviously take attendance, you know, we are well beyond that stage where we need to take attendance, right? But what it does mean is this, that if there's somebody in, the, in class who's really been active, you know, you, and you feel free to interrupt me and ask me questions. I may not be able to answer it immediately. I might want to finish my train of thought, but then I'll get back to you, okay, if you have a certain question, all right? And I'll answer questions in class. Um, and, you know, I know who's coming and who isn't, essentially. I mean, I have a pretty, pretty good idea. So that 10% really is neutral. But if you've been coming often, okay, and you've been asking questions, then that will count in your favor. And so it may move your final grade. Let's say your final grade is hovering between a B plus and an A minus. It's not quite clear. Well, that'll push, push you towards the A minus. That's what that 10% will do. There's some people, okay, who actually never bother to pick up their midterm. Now that's one way I know that you're not coming to class. I'm giving you a really good hint here. Please come and pick up your midterm because frankly I've had this in every class. I mean the midterm is handed back in week seven and at the end of week 10 that midterm is still lying in my folder. Right? I mean that's a very good way for me to know that the student is not coming to class and is not even remotely interested in what's happening. And then they'll come to me and say, well how come that 10 person didn't assist me? Well, it should be quite obvious why it didn't assist you in that case. Right? So that's how that 10% is really going to be calculated. But, but in the vast majority of cases, it's simply going to stay neutral, so to speak. Right? Because your grade will really be determined by the midterm and the final. Now let me get to the subject of readings. Okay, so uh, the, the majority of the readings are all online. And I have checked the links. All the links are working at present. There may be one or two readings that are not yet linked. But all the readings that are linked, those links are in fact operational. Right? Um, is there anybody here who doesn't know how to access the readings if you've you know, come as a transfer student or something? You know, you just go to the syllabus. Yes? Uh, yeah, I think I was a transfer student. I don't know how to access the readings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. So, so what you do is you, you go to the syllabus of the course, and you click on that reading. That reading will be highlighted. Sometimes it'll be the author, sometimes it'll be the title, sometimes it'll be the page numbers. It will be one of those three that's been, that's highlighted. You click on that, and it will ask you to log on, because those readings are only accessible to registered students in the class. They're not accessible to everybody else. Okay? So you just click, click on that, it'll ask you to log in, and then you put in your user, ID and password, and 
you'll be able to access all the readings. And usually you'll be able to download all of them as PDF documents. Right? What I would suggest that you do is you download all of the readings at one shot. You know, put them in a folder so you have them. So at, you know, if any, you know, once in a while I've even had somebody tell me, well, my internet connection went out the day before the midterm was due. You know, that's not my responsibility, right? So you just get all of the readings downloaded if you can, and you have them available to you. Yes? Are these several readings Yes. So I, I hadn't finished yet with the reading. So the, as I said, the majority of the readings are online. Some are not. So there are a few books that you are expected to buy. They have been ordered for you at the UCLA bookstore in Ackerman. Has anybody gone to the bookstore? And are they available? Yes. All of the books? OK. Right. So all the books are available. If for any reason they run out of the books, these books are not rare items. Just go to Amazon.com. You'll find used copies. Okay? Or whichever your favorite you know, book vendor is. Okay? You'll find used copies. There'll be used copies because Ackerman usually will order used copies in addition to new copies. If, if there are used copies available, you should be able to access the books without any difficulty whatsoever. Yes? So you added the three books that are required that are actually the Kindle, Primer, Display, and Evernote, which will all have more features. Right? Okay. So you know. I've heard from a few friends that a lot of the books in, the, in courses here are kept on reserve in the library, and you can go and like reserve them out for two hours at a time. I did. I did. I did ask the library to put them on reserve. Yeah, yeah. They should be on reserve. Not only the books that are required for the course, but there should be a few additional books as well, okay. which might be useful for you when you're writing your papers or exams or whatever. Yeah. If for any reason you find that they're not on reserve, send me an email. And I'll look into it. Okay, but they were, but but I did ask the library to put them on reserve, you know, early in the summer, so they should be on reserve by now. Yeah. Any questions so far, having to do with the requirements, readings, or anything that I've said up till this point in time? Okay. So I, I think that this pretty much takes care of all the administrative matters, having to do with the class, except that I haven't mentioned to you my office hours. So this is what this is on the board. My office is in bunch, five two four zero. Uh, and my office hours are Thursdays, 1.45 to 4.15. If you're unable to make it during the office hours and you'd like to talk to me, send me an email and we'll make an appointment. Right? So, but but during, these, during this period, you know, this two and a half hour slot, I'm there in my office. And you can come and see me. And you can come see me about the course or any other matter, you know, pertaining to your interest in history or whatever the case might be. Okay? All right, now let me move on to more interesting things, more substantive things. And, and I want to begin, as I said, with some comments on um, uh, what kind of course this is and what does it mean to study the history of British India. Of course, we could ask a similar question of any intellectual enterprise of this sort. What does it mean to study the history of Rome? What does it mean to study the history of the Arab world or North Africa? So forth and so on. Right? And some people might say, well, one obvious reason we might want to study the history of British India is uh, the fact that a great deal of what goes on, what happens in India today, has some relationship to what transpired in India during the period of colonial rule. And when I say the history of British India, um, we're talking about roughly early 1600s. India did not come under colonial rule in the early 1600s. Okay? But the British came to India in 1601. And let me say this at the outset, because it's something to ponder about. At no time in the next 350 years were there ever more than 100,000 Britishers in India at any point in time. 100,000 Britishers ruling a country in the... 20th century with a population of 300 million. Right? So we're, it's, we're not talking about huge number of Englishmen and Englishwomen and Irishmen. So we have to make a distinction between obviously the English and the British. And sometimes I may be using the word synonymously because in certain contexts it may make sense to do so. But when I say British, of course, I'm including the English, the Irish, and the Scots, and you know, the Welsh. 
right? And then when I'm speaking about the English, I really am, I really do mean English men and English women. Okay? And there, this distinction is important because uh, the Irish, who were themselves colonized by the English, right? For those of you who know something of the history of the British Isles, you know that Ireland was really, to put it quite bluntly, brutally colonized by the English. Right? As there are some people who have even argued that even the Great Potato Famine, uh, as a consequence of which you had a huge migration of the Irish uh, to the United States, uh, that the English were responsible for it in many ways. Now, we're not interested in that assessment at the moment. But why am I mentioning this to you? Because, because even though they might have been colonized by the English, the Irish were very good at being colonizers themselves, at least when they were in India. And we need to keep that in mind. So, some, so let's remember that we, the distinction between the English and the British is important, but there are certain cases where we can collapse it. right? So now the question here was that if you look at the history of British India, I'm saying to you that 100,000 Britishers in India at most, at any point in time, governing a country of 300 million in the early 20th century. right? How were the English able to persist in India so long? Yet it is very clear, of course, that the English did not colonize India right from the outset. In fact, they didn't come to colonize India. They came as traders. So on 31st December 1600, uh, Queen Elizabeth, then the monarch of Britain, Great Britain, right? she agreed to give a group of English gentlemen a charter to set up a trading company. That trading company is going to be known as the East India Company. And from 1601 onwards, the East India Company is going to commence trading with India. Now, in the early 1600s, India is under the rule of the Mughals. The Mughal Empire was conceivably the greatest empire of its day in the world. You know, in, in Persia, you have the Safavids, right? You've got a number of empires, but it is generally conceded that the Mughal Empire at its height was certainly one of the greatest empires in history. So when the English are coming to India, they're not coming into a vacuum. They're not stepping into a vacuum. Not that there is ever a vacuum. I mean, this has been one of the pretenses of colonization. You know, so there's this Latin phrase, it's called terra nullis, right? Terra nullis is empty land, nothing. So then, then the English go to Australia, one of the pretenses is there's nothing there. It's just barren wasteland. Well, it's not a barren wasteland because if you are an Aboriginal and you're living there, you know, there are things that you see which the white man is not able to see at all. That the person has some familiarity, the Aboriginal has some familiarity with the landscape, right? And sees things and understands the plants. And Europeans coming to Australia think that, well, they've really come into a place that's a complete barren wasteland. Now, of course, the English, when they're coming to India, they're not assuming that India is a barren wasteland. All the shades of that terra nullis doctrine are present even in the colonization of the English. Because one, one different variant of that is, oh yes, there are Indians there, but they don't make the land productive. We hardy Europeans, we're going to make the land productive. You know, these Indians are just a lazy bunch of fellows just sitting around. You know, the land is lying waste. That's, that's a variation of the terra nullis doctrine. It's not like it's empty. They know that it's not empty. They know that there's a history there. Right? So forth and so on. All right? So they come to India, early 1600s, and when they come there, there's a great empire already present there. Now, gradually, there's going to be the decline of the Mughal Empire. So this is the common view that as the Mughal Empire goes into decline. And precipitous decline, particularly after the death of the emperor known by the name of Aurangzeb in 1707, that, that then a vacuum is created in Indian politics. And the British are going to take advantage of that. That's one common view. And so we're going to take a brief look at that period, right, the early 1600s, and we're also going to look at the presence of, for example, the Portuguese. Because there were other European powers who were in India as well. 
We're not really going to spend too much time on the French and the Dutch and the Portuguese, but we're just going to take at least a peripheral look so that you can see that it's not simply the history of the British in India, it's, there's a European presence, a larger European presence in India, right? And from there then we move into obviously the 17th century. But let me return to the question, you know, why study the history of British India? And as I said, you could ask the same question, why study the history of Rome? So if you said, okay, well, why study the history of Rome? So let me give you one very simple illustration. Uh, somebody could argue that, well, uh, if you look at the form of republican government that you have, okay? Uh, I mean, the United States is a republic, right? Uh, if, if you look at the form of government that you have here, and so you've got uh, uh, the House of Representatives in the legislative branch, and you've got the Senate. And if, for those of you who remember your Roman history, if you didn't do any Roman history at UCLA, but if you remember your Roman history from high school, uh, you'll remember that before Rome became an empire, it was a republic, right? And before it was a republic, it was a kingdom. And when it was a republic, you had councils and senators, two groups of body to check the power, okay? Check each other's power as well. Right? So somebody could argue, ah, w w what this suggests is that at least in a rudimentary form, perhaps even in a more extensive form, the shape of the American government owes something to what had transpired in Rome, say, 2,000 years ago. Right? About seven, eight years ago, I was absolutely startled when I got a call from a person who identified himself as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. Now, to be quite honest, my politics is I have a complete aversion to all militaries in any shape or form. So I'm wondering, why is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, you know, calling me? And he said, uh, you know, are you Professor Lal? Yes. Uh, what can I do for you? He introduces himself and he says, I'd like to come and see you. And I said, what on earth would you want to come and see me for? I asked him quite candidly. I mean, and he says that, look, I mean, I'm on leave at the moment from the U.S. Army. I'm working for the RAND Corporation as a defense analyst, and I've been involved in counterinsurgency in Iraq. And I happen to have some familiarity with your doctoral dissertation. My doctoral dissertation, which goes back to 1992, had to do with problems of law and order in British India. How did the British deal with problems of law and order? Now, of course, the Americans have to think about law and order or law and disorder in Iraq. And so he thought that, well, perhaps if he spoke to people like myself who specialized in colonial history, well, he might be able to get some insights, right? So he comes to my office. And we have a very polite, somewhat constrained chat, if I may put it this way, for about half an hour. And he says to me that, look, we are having a bit of a problem. I said, isn't it in Iraq? I said, that's a... A massive understatement, I think. <laughs> a bit of a problem? But I said, nevertheless, tell me what the nature of the problem is. And he says that, look, we've got this Sunni-Shia divide, and frankly, we can't make head or tail of it. I said, well, look, I'm not a theologian, and I'm no expert on Islam either. So how do you expect me to help you? He said that, look, if you look at India, and, th and this is where he refers to my dissertation. He says that, you know, you have a Hindu-Muslim divide in India. How did the British handle the Hindu-Muslim divide in India? Maybe that might help us understand how we are going to handle the Sunni-Shia divide in Iraq. And so then I said to him that, well, I don't think that there really is any intrinsic Hindu-Muslim divide in India. I was quite candid. I said, I'm not saying that, look, that the history of Hindu-Muslim relations has always been hunky-dory. Oh, you know, they've always been on splendid terms for the last 1,500 years. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting that they've always been on splendid terms and that there were a huge number of intermarriages between Hindus and Muslims, so forth and so on. On the other hand, I don't really want to accept this assumption that there is a divide between Hindus and Muslims in India. Who was responsible for this divide? Did Hindus and Muslims always harbor deep sentiments of animosity towards each other? Right? When did Hindus become Hindus? I, how many of you are aware of the fact that 
no so-called Hindu in India ever described himself or herself as a Hindu before, let's say, I'll give you a ballpark figure, roughly 1800s, early 1800s. Now that doesn't mean that there were no Hindus as such, but they called themselves Shaivites or Vaishnavites or Shaktos or Tantrics or Kabir Pantis, so forth and so on. This category we call Hindu is a corporate monolithic category into which all of these people were assimilated. All right. So I said, how, how do you assume that there's a Hindu-Muslim divide? And I can tell you how he assumed it. And this leads to one of the fundamental problems in the study of history, particularly the history of countries such as India. And that is that there's always a tendency for the interpreter to use the categories of European history to understand the non-West. This is a fundamental problem, and this is why you're going to be reading excerpts from Edward Said's Orientalism. Okay? And there's no running away from this problem. It has to be confronted head-on and brutally in order to be able to understand the nature of the problem. Because you see, if you're a European, you look at your own past, and frankly, it is a past of bloodshed. I mean, look at the, look at the sectarian wars that took place between the Catholics and the, and the Protestants. I don't have to say this as a historian of India. People who are specialists of European history know that very well. So when the Europeans come to India, they just assume that because religious conflict was endemic to Europe, therefore it was endemic to India. And this is a wholly erroneous assumption. I'll give you a very different illustration. Nothing to do with Indian history. And I would recommend this book. There's a book by Mark Mazover. M-A-Z-O-W-E-R. Book is called Salonika. Okay? You know, it's Salonika. It's in Greece. The book is called Salonika. Mark Mazover is a historian at Columbia University. It's a fantastic book. And it's basically a history of Salonika where, let's say 500 years ago, you had Christians, Jews, and Muslims. All three communities in very large numbers inhabiting the same space and coming to very reasonable accommodations with each other, understanding each other, inhabiting a shared community to some degree. There were always differences, of course. But we, we don't want to minimize the differences either. right? But they're inhabiting a shared community to a great degree. Now what's interesting is that when the Nazis come into Salonika, because the book ends with a description of what happened to Salonika. You, I think you can imagine what happened once the Nazis come in. But what's really interesting is when the Nazis first come to Salonika, they say, where's the Jewish ghetto? And they're told, there is no ghetto in Salonika. There is no Jewish ghetto. Now, they were completely bewildered. Because in their experience of European history, everywhere in Europe, the Jews always lived in a ghetto. They were always forced into a ghetto. So therefore assumed ah, that this must be the case right in Salonika as well. Well, some people happen to be a bit more civilized. You know? Right? That's, that's one conclusion. Some people happen to be a bit more civilized and know how to handle their differences. And this is the reason why it's imperative that we understand, okay, what are some of the problems in the writing and interpretation of the history of British India, right? And so, going back to the case of that lieutenant colonel, right, who came and visited me, he was acutely disappointed because when he left at the, after, at the end of that half an hour, I think he probably surmised that he'd learned nothing from his standpoint because I was trying to tell him that, frankly, this idea that there's this religious divide in India and that it's always been there, okay, is an erroneous assumption. And of course, the question of how Sunni and Shia all came to be accommodated under one corporate category again, called Islam, and then there are many others as well. There are a group of people known, for example, as the Ahmadiyyas, who are not even recognized as Muslims in some cases. Okay? But they certainly think of themselves as Muslims. So, if one wanted to argue that, well, one studies the history of British India because it may have some, quote, relevance. 
I don't think that that would be quite appropriate either. I don't want to, on the other hand, give the answer that, well, things are worthy of study intrinsically. We don't need to give really any reason for why we should study the history of British India um, any more than we give any reason for why we study the history of Rome. I mean, of course, I've suggested that uh, I gave you a very rudimentary example, uh, almost drawn from a school textbook in a way, that if you look at the form of government that you have in the United States, well, you could say that in some rudimentary form it was already present in Rome. What this might mean is that history helps us understand the nature of temporality. It helps us understand the nature of temporality. You know, what is the relationship of the past and the present and the future? Uh, most historians, 99% would say, well, history is the study of the past. I think it's actually the study of the future in some ways. Right? That we're trying, to, we're trying to understand certain phenomena, and then when we understand these phenomena, we give shape to the world in which we live in. And we try to create, in some respects, a better world. There's yet another way of looking at it. Somebody might say that, well, look, in order to be a world citizen, whatever that means. I, I, I don't like these phrases, world citizen. It's hard enough being a citizen, let, let alone being a world citizen. Okay? And many people don't even have rights of citizenship. You, know, you could be nominally a citizen. For example, I mean, I'll tell you candidly, my view. I, I, I think African Americans in this country are not really viewed as full citizens. Right? I mean, they have legal citizenship. There's a difference between legal citizenship and citizenship on the ground where you have full rights of citizenship and claims and entitlements that you can make. Okay? So I don't know what it means to be a world citizen, but very often you hear this. You know? Nowadays they like to attach the prefix world to everything. You know, we want to be a world-class university, a world-class city. I just arrived in, at LAX from Washington DC two days ago and there was this big announcement, please bear with us while we do improvements to make LAX a world-class airport, right? You know? Uh, just unthinking phrases that they just throw in regularly nowadays, you know? It makes you feel good. Yeah, we're trying to do something worthwhile, right? So somebody would say, well, the nature of studying Indian history is to better understand India. Well, I think I've been teaching here for 20 years. I take a slightly different view of the matter. And that view is that at the end of the day, I'm well aware of the fact that the bulk of you are here because, hey, you know, many of you are here because you're going to fulfill some requirement in non-Western history. So whether it's China, India, Africa, whatever. Okay? Some of you have an intrinsic interest. Very few of you will persist with this interest. I'm being realistic. I mean, because I've gone through college myself, there are all kinds of classes you take and, you know, earth science or whatever because you need six credits and, you know, such and such field, so you take it. Right? and try to get through it as quickly as you can. Now, I'm hopeful that that's not going to be the case here, but that's neither here nor there. What I really want to say is, let's try to understand the politics of what it means to do interpretive work. You're all American citizens or permanent residents, maybe some foreign students, but you're all Americans. The greatest imperative for you is to understand the nature of American history and the nature of your own society. And my submission to you is that you can never understand your own society and your own history unless you understand some other society in history equally well. So my endeavor in this class will be to make sure that when you walk out of here, that will be the litmus test for me. And I'd be happy to hear what some of you think about whether I've passed that litmus, litmus test or not is that at the end of week 10, some of you will come to me and say, hey, not only did I get to know something about India, but I think I'm seeing my own society and my own history in a slightly different way. That for me would be one purpose that would have been accomplished. Because ultimately you're here, you're grounded in this society, right? So how you understand the nature of, for example, American exceptionalism, there were many people who quite naively thought that Barack Obama would be very different from, you know, his predecessors. Let's not name all of them, you know, okay? Not very illustrious, most of them, if I may put it this way, okay? And so what do we have? Uh, 
Barack Obama gives a speech at the United Nations. You know, the General Assembly is meeting, right? And what does he say? Let's admit it. The United States is an exceptional nation. Why is it an exceptional nation? I mean, I find that hugely offensive, frankly, you know? I mean, I'm accustomed to Indians saying that, ah, ah. There's nothing in the world quite like Hindu spirituality. Uh, we're you know, a preeminent you know, country for religion in the world. Half of the world's religions were founded in India. Uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism. Uh, the place where the largest number of Zoroastrians stay in the world is India after the, they were driven out of Iran. India, by the way, is one country every historian of global Judaism will agree with that. One country in the world where there was never a single instance of anti-Semitism. Not a single instance of anti-Semitism in India. You know? So many Indians will say, ah, well, that, look how exceptional we are. Different countries have different reasons for claiming why they're exceptional. But I certainly think that the United States makes this claim far more often than the rest of the world put together. Right? And I think we need to question that. You know? And if uh, Americans say, well, the reason why America is exceptional is because here you get these stories from rags to riches. I know plenty of rags to riches stories from every country that I've been to. If I look at India and I look at the rise of the group of people known as the Dalits, you know. Okay? I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that the Dalits are now all doing well as a group of people, as 150 million people. No, they're still among the most oppressed, much in the way in which African Americans today still occupy the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder in the United States, next to Native Americans. That's not a figure that I have to come up with. You read anybody, right? Any sociologist writing in the U.S. But the fact that Barack Obama has risen to the presidency, you know, has no real relationship with that at all. But certainly there are plenty of rags to riches stories in India. So that cannot be the grounds on which we say that the United States is exceptional. You know, right? So what I'm trying to reiterate is this, that the reason we're going to be studying the history of British India is not only because I want you to know about what happened in India for a period of 350 years. right? And somebody might say that the sh sheer fact that I'm standing in front of you is a consequence of British rule in India. I'm speaking to you in English. Right? Where did English come from? Right? And if you look at, if you look at I the elite Indians, they all converse with each other in English today. You, know? you look at the elite institutions. Do you know that in India, in every court, the proceedings, whether the court is in South India, in Tamil Nadu, whether it's in Bengal, whether it's in Delhi, the proceedings are always in English. I was just told this by a friend of mine just a few days ago. You know, I wasn't aware of that. I thought that, well, maybe in some courts in you know, South India, some of the proceedings might be in Tamil. No, all the proceedings that take place in courts in India extensive system of courts, of course, country of 1.2 billion people, right? all take place in English. Yes? What level of court? Not, not, not like the local courts. It would also be English, especially a, a, not speaking Tamil. A, appeals, courts, okay? If you look at the panchayat level, okay, panchayat is a local level, those proceedings are very often going to be in the vernacular. I'm talking about, I'm talking about when I say all courts, I mean all high-level courts. I yeah. In a, I worked in yeah. India yeah. at the courts, yeah. all in English. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, this is the interesting thing. So you could say, hey, this is this is the consequence of British rule, right, in India. But nonetheless, whatever the intrinsic reasons for studying the history of British India, I'm suggesting to you, and that's what I want to reiterate, that I hope it's going to make you reflect on the nature of. American history and American society. All right? Now, what are some of the problems inherent in the study of Indian history? I've already hinted at the largest problem. We're going to talk about this at much greater length in the next class. In my introductory remarks on Tuesday, I'm going to talk about Orientalism. If you have not read that, I had asked you to read, read 
you know, read it for today, uh, and you can see some of the comments that I made already touch upon the things that Edward Sayy talks about. Um, but we're going to talk about this at much greater length. And there's an article by Ronald Linden, which is a very difficult article. And as it, the syllabus states very clearly, don't worry. If you find it too difficult, don't worry about it. You know, I, I'll try to clarify what Indian is really saying. Because Saeed, when he wrote Orientalism, um, he was not writing with specific reference to India at all. I mean, there are, of course, references to India. You know, because he was basically, the, insofar as he uses examples to make his argument, the examples are largely drawn from French and European interaction with the Arab world. Okay? And, and what Ronald Linden attempts to do, if I may put it in a very casual way, is attempts to use the Saidian framework or template with reference to India. Right? So it, this is Orientalist Constructions of India. And he's got a full-length book, but you're obviously not reading that book. You're, you're reading the shorter piece, the 40-page piece that he wrote in Modern Asian Studies. So what are some of the problems in the, inherent in the study of Indian history? And in order to answer that question, we have to ask such question as, who's writing these histories? Who are they writing these histories for? Are they writing these histories for other Europeans? Are they writing these histories for Indians? And when I say these histories, what do I mean by these histories? So for example, if you look at the 19th century, so you look at these uh, administrators, there's actually a phrase used for them. The British administrators of India called them the scholar administrator types. Because what's really interesting is people like, don't worry about the names because you'll encounter them later on. You know, if you don't get the names right now, you can get them later on. And incidentally, I think you know it's self it's, 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 it's obvious. All the lectures here are being podcasted and video streamed. So if you miss a lecture, you can access it at your leisure later on. That's not a reason, by the way, not to come to class. You know, uh, I hope that the lectures are interesting enough. Nobody has ever accused me of putting them to sleep. There may be other accusations, certainly. Um, but I don't think you're going to go to sleep in my lectures, in my classes. And I think that there's always a different dynamic when you listen to a lecture live and there'll be exchanges later on which are not going to be captured very often on the podcast. Okay? But that's an aside. All right? So now, what I was trying to suggest is this. When I say these histories, what are these histories I'm talking about? Just one type of history. I'm not talking about the totality of all the histories written about British India. But in the 19th century, there was a very common type of history written by the scholar administrator. And what I mean by that is these are British administrators who are governing India. For example, Thomas Munro, Mount Stuart Elphinstone, John Malcolm. I'm talking about the first half of the 19th century, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. And, and these people are holding very lofty positions. I mean, they're not clerks. These are people who are governors of Bombay or governors of Central Province or the governor general of India. This is among the top echelon of the ruling elite. And they've got quite a few things on their hands, you would think. And yet, most of them find time to write voluminous histories. So Mount Stuart Elphinstone, for example, writes... Uh, a really voluminous history. I'm talking about like 1,500 pages. And that's just only, by the way, one work. I mean, he writes several. Monroe. I mean, can you imagine George W. Bush, right, writing a scholarly account, let's say, of Iraq? I mean, that would be a miracle, you know? I mean, you know, in your dreams you might be able to do that because it'd be difficult enough for him to write a memo, much less write a 1,500 page history of Iraq or Afghanistan. Right? So notwithstanding my criticism of British rule, there are interesting things happening there. And some of these people were dedicated scholars. They took an effort to learn languages. Right? And after doing the job of governing the native, as they say, you know, they'd come back to their bungalow and you know somebody would put on the lights there was no electricity of course so now you'd have to you know have the wicks and everything right 
candles. Somebody would put that on, you know, because of course all of these people had a huge staff, domestic staff, right? And then from 9 to 12, they'd labor on their histories by hand. It's quite, quite marvelous, frankly, you know? So these are the scholar-administrator types. Now, the fact that they wrote these histories is marvelous. What they wrote may not be marvelous, because then we'd have to see, ah, what are the assumptions with which they write about the history of India? And this problem continues down to the present day. I mean, any time I pick up the New York Times, right, which is a newspaper I read, every day, without fail, I'll see at least one article which will show me the persistence of this kind of Orientalism, okay, today, without fail. And forget about how they write about the conflict in Palestine. I'm talking about other kinds of, you know, how they write about Iran, how they write about India, yeah? The certain assumptions are just there. I mean, anytime they have an article in India, half of the article is taken up by giving you a capsule history. India got partitioned in 1947. You know, half of the article is taken up by that. You know, they were, they're Hindus and Muslims uh, in India, right? You have to sort of give this uh, summary account before they can even talk about the event in question that they're interested in, you know? So th this problem persists. And when I say, this problem, I'm talking about the problem of Orientalism, the problem of representation. Who represents whom? Who speaks for whom? With what consequences? With what assumptions? Right? And we'll discuss this in much greater detail. So we begin with the questions such as who is writing these histories and who are they writing them for? What are their presuppositions? Right? What is the relationship between colonialism and Orientalism? Right? Because today, for example, you might say, well, we don't really have colonialism, certainly not in the form in which we had it in, obviously, the 19th century. Right? Um, they might be neo-colonial situations today, right? Certainly. I mean, the U.S., for example, is still the dominant power. Right? The very fact that the U.S. can think about, well, should we or should we not? Hmm. Today. Let's attack Syria. Should we or should we not attack Iran? Most countries don't have the luxury of thinking that way, do they? You know? Think about it. So the, what is the relationship of certain representations of societies and what we call colonialism or neocolonialism? Right? So those are some, as I said, very elementary questions that I want you to think about first. And we'll have a much greater discussion of these um, when I give you a more detailed uh, discussion of uh, Orientalism on Tuesday. All right, now let me go through the syllabus um, so you have an idea of what's in store for you and how we're going to proceed in this class. So today it says Edward Said Orientalism, you know, brief introduction, but we'll continue with this uh, on uh, Tuesday and then week one. Um, that's next week. So we have uh, K.M. Paniker. K.M. Paniker is an Indian historian uh, who wrote this book, which uh, is called Asia and Western Dominance. You're reading some um, excerpts from that, very short excerpts, 30-odd 30, 30 pages. Uh, one of the things that Paniker tried to do was to suggest what is it that made the British period of Indian history different from the Mughal period. So, for example, the fact that the Mughals are, if I may put it this way, a land empire. The British are seaborne empire, right? That, that's a cardinal difference. We could also say, extrapolating from Paniker and many others, that the British, unlike the Mughals, did not really assimilate into Indian society. If I may use that phrase, you know that there's a, you know that in India they have what they call the caste system, right? So you've got this hierarchy of castes, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras. We look at this, all of this later on. The Brahmins are the top of that ladder, right? Well, the British, one could argue, out brahmin the Brahmins. You know, they, they thought they were vastly superior to even the Brahmins. And I think it is a fact that really cannot be disputed that by and large the British really never integrated into Indian society. You know? 
Now, there are people who have argued, and we're going to do a, we, we, we look at one of those readings, people who argue that, well, in the early 18th century, it was quite different. It was quite different that English traders, English colonial officials, right? You know, they consorted with Indian society, and in particular with Indian women. But this stopped after a period of time, particularly after English women started coming into India. That's the standard argument. And when the English women started, started coming to India, they told the men, well, you, we, we can't let you do this hanky-panky stuff anymore. Now we're here, you know, right? The standard argument that you find. That, well, in the early 18th century, things were qu quite different. Um, but then, certainly, this feeling of racial super superiority became so deeply embedded among the English that they never really consorted with the Indians. And I think it is also generally conceded by scholars that people who are known as Anglo-Indians, right? so this is the offspring of British and Indian marriages, the, the Anglo-Indians were very badly treated in India by the, by the, by the British. You know? This is, as I said, not even really disputed. I mean, this is quite widely conceded by people who have looked at the role of Anglo-Indians in Indian society. Right? And then we have this reading from Metcalf and Metcalf. So that's one of those books that you have to buy. The readings are not online because you're reading nearly the entirety of the book. Yeah, nearly the entirety of the book, a concise history of modern India. And what it does is it gives you the backdrop. You know, who are the Mughals? Um, because as I said, the British are not coming into a vacuum. They're not stepping into a vacuum. Right? I mean, they're stepping into a place that's uh, full of history, so to speak. Right? Uh, the Portuguese have been there. You've got a great empire there. You've got huge religious and linguistic diversity, uh, right? Enormous religious and linguistic diversity in India. And then uh, we have a short account by Philip Lawson, the East India Company, pages 1 to 41. So, you, you know, the founding of the company, the early years of the company, what English traders were doing in India and so on. Um, I should also say at this point that the inclusion of readings there does not necessarily suggest that I agree with the point of view of the person who's written that account or narrative. So sometimes you'll get a critical reading in my lectures of that. Sometimes I agree and sometimes I've chosen readings that I think uh, <coughs> re represent my point of view and sometimes I've chosen readings that don't. Um, but I think that those are readings that one has to engage with. Right? Then in the subsequent week, company rule. So we look now we begin to look at once company rule, that phrase should already indicate to you what's happened. The company is now no, no longer just simply a company of traders, right? They have assumed certain responsibilities. So from traders, they have gravitated towards becoming rulers, right? Well, how did that happen? What was the nature of that transition? What was the nature of social life in early British India? And how was the conquest of India achieved? Traditionally, the date that is given is 1757, the Battle of Plassey, as it's called. So we look at that, you know, right? and we have a number of readings there. So that reading by Bailey, so uh, Sir Christopher Bailey uh, is uh, one of the most well-known historians of uh, India and the world, uh, being based at Cambridge University for well over th three decades, uh, voluminous uh, works. Um, and we're going to look at his interpretation. Uh, and then we have a book by William Dalrymple, an Englishman who now lives in India. Um, and and this, this work I was referring to early on, very casually, when I was saying that, for example, there's a narrative that, well, in early 18th century India, for example, uh, you know, through, uh, and going into the mid-1700s uh, mid, uh, as well, perhaps in some cases even into the early 1800s, the history of the English in India was quite different, that there was more interaction with the Indians. Uh, so William Dalrymple, White Mughals, Love and Betrayal in 18th Century India, uh, we're reading the first 80 pages, and then we're reading an essay um, by Thomas McCulley called Warren Hastings. Um, I haven't give you, given you the link here, uh, but uh, this essay is available online, and I'll send out an email to the class uh, you know, re regarding this particular reading. So, and you're going to read excerpts from this. Warren Hastings was um, one of the uh, early governor generals of India, uh, a, a critical and crucial figure in the history uh, of the establishment of British rule in India. Then we get to ruling India, texts of governorship, theory and practice of governance. Well, how exactly did the British rule India? What were the theories that they used? Now you might say, what, what does it mean to speak about theories? Well, let me give you an illustration. So for example, there's a school of thought among the British who argue that 
Indians are to be treated like children, all Indians. Because frankly, the rational faculty is not that well developed among Indians. And therefore, this also means that they will always be in a position of tutelage. Because, of course, you might say, well, but don't children at some point become adults? But remember that according to this theory, all Indian adults are like children in terms of their rational faculty. So it doesn't matter. You could say you could have evolutionary theory and say, ah, well, eventually children become adults and, you know, they assume responsibilities for themselves. Right? The problem is that in India, not only are there children, but the adults are very much like children. And so therefore, this is an argument for saying we shall be ruling India in perpetuity, forever. In perpetuity. This is one school of thought. There's another school of thought, which you could call the trusteeship school. So we are in India as trustees. You know, for example, if you're an adult, I mean, some of you might have been beneficiaries of trustee accounts. You know, your parents put in uh, money into an account. And until you reach the age of 18, you can't touch that account. But once you reach that age of 18, so they're acting in trust for you, right? They're trustees. That once you reach the age of 18, you assume the responsibilities of an adult. Right? So the trusteeship theory says that, well, we're only here to facilitate the growth of Indians, bring the blessings of civilization and Christianity, etc., etc., right, to these people. Once they have learned the protocols of governance, once they understand what it means to have law and order, so forth and so on, then the need for us will no longer be felt. Right? So this is what I mean when I say theories of government. These are not the only two schools of thought. There are other schools of thought as well. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking at this section. What are the different schools of thought about what it means to govern India? Right? So we read chapters from Metcalf and Metcalf, John Malcolm. So here, I want to make a little point. We're reading primary texts as well. Right? So John Malcolm is one of these scholar administrator types that I mentioned to you. So this piece is wonderful. Notes of instructions to assistants and officers. So you're an English colonial official, mid-level, lower level. You're out in the field in the 1830s. You know? How should you interact with the native? Right? What are the protocols? Should you be polite? Should you not be polite? What if they're practicing some form of religion that you consider to be abhorrent? You know? Should you immediately go try to ban it? Right? Or should you say, ah, look, that might be a little risky because nothing is as dear to a people as a religion. So if we ban certain religious rights that we consider to be barbaric, these people might get upset. If they get upset, those become the conditions for revolting. Right? So this is what the notes of instructions. It's basically telling English officials, how should you behave you know, when you're interacting with Indians? Right? So it's like little mis-etiquette so to speak, for the colonial age. Okay? Then we've got Bernard Cohn, the British in Benares and from Indian status to British contract. Bernard Cohn, probably the major historian from the United States of India until certainly very recently, right? uh, worked on British India and in fact many of the major ideas that have shaped our understanding of British India have come from Bernard Cohn's works. So we're going to read two of his essays. Okay? And then Philip Mason, the man, the man who ruled India, very Light work, just to give you a little idea of how a sort of quasi-journalistic kind of British, you know, person writes about the men who ruled India during this period, right? And that's why it says, skim these pages, you know, because in comparison with some of the readings, it's not of that level of sophistication. But, but it'll give you some idea. How do people write about these things at a popular level? All right? Then weeks four and five, the conquest of knowledge. So that's the middle portion of the course. Now, let me make clear why I think this is, in fact, the most interesting part of the course, certainly from my perspective. Every conquest, no matter of what kind, is a conquest of knowledge. The British did not simply have military superiority in India. It's not simply the case. It's true that they did. But it's, the situation is much more complex, right? They did not simply, in a sense, interfere 
with the trade in India and eventually establish a kind of economic trade which was in their favor. They did all of that. Right? What is more interesting to me is the colonization of the mind. The colonization of the mind. And that's more interesting because its consequences are to be perceived down to the present day. Today, Orientalism is not simply a problem of how an American or a European <coughs> excuse me, writes a history of India. The problem is that most Indians who write the history of India are using Orientalist ideas and very often they're not even aware of it. Very often they're not even aware of it. This is a paramount problem. Now, if you study it on the ground, you come up with such things as, well, why were the British so interested in translating Indian works? Works from Sanskrit or Bengali or some other language into English. And of course we know the European answer is, well, the European answer is, uh, they were interested because after all, the Europeans represent enlightenment. This is the natural curiosity of the European to know everything. Well, I don't think it was just a natural curiosity of the European to know everything. No, I mean, there were, there were tangible, practical consequences. The creations of grammars and dictionaries, right? Huge numbers of grammars and dictionaries are created. And I'll give you very concrete examples of how this work was done. And why we cannot be naive in thinking that, well, this is simply the enlightenment urge, you know. Right? Because I've heard that argument, by the way, endless number of times, even today, you know, that what distinguishes Europe and America from, you know, the Arabs and the Indians, it, you know, th this part of the world has a natural intellectual curiosity about that part of the world. But they don't have any curiosity about, you know, except to emigrate to America. That's different, you know, right? The, the intellectual curiosity is, is, is a, a gift of the Europeans. No, I think the, the matter is far more complex than that. All right? And in fact, the conquest of knowledge, the colonization of the mind was the critical component of what we would describe as colonial rule. You know? The idea that Indians are effeminate. How did that shape the very structure of the Indian army? How did that idea come about? So there's an essay by Robert Orme. Who's Robert Orme? Robert Orme is, in, is a Britisher writing, in India, writing about India. On, he writes an essay called Effeminacy of the Inhabitants of Hindustan. Hindustan is India. Right? Effeminacy. Yeah, the men are like all women. Yeah, this is a different variation. Now, either they're like children or they're like women. You know? What does that mean? What is the sexual politics of all of this? Right? Mekhale, Minute on Indian Education, where he says that literature in Indian languages is worthless. Right? So English should be brought into India. Right? I was talking earlier about, about the use of English in India. Right? So these are some of the primary texts. So if you see how it's divided, it says documents, because those are primary texts. And then the second half gives you scholarly assessments. Okay? Which, again... A, a chapter from Bailey, a piece by myself, uh, by Bernard Cohn, a couple of pieces, and then an introduction by myself to a book called The History of Railway Thieves in India. Right? Because here what we're going to see is we're going to see how anthropology, botany, geology, history, okay? huge number of disciplines were all brought into service of colonialism. The relationship of the entire apparatus, intellectual apparatus that the British produced, that relationship of that to colonial rule itself, right? And then we move into the second half of the course, the colonize, colonizer and the colonized social encounters. So now we move into a different set of questions. What was the nature of social encounters? Now we're talking about the 19th century, not the early 18th century. The Dalrymple book is like 18th century. Now, 19th century. So the British have been around in India for quite some time. What was the nature of social interactions between Indians, you know? Um, you, there are certain British institutions such as a club, right? The club. 
uh, the hill station. For those of you who have any familiarity with India, you know there's something called the hill station. This is where you go to in the mountains when it gets really hot in the plains. And in the hill station, the British and recreated British society completely. Okay? Who are the Indians they interacted with? The, and it's, I think, uncontestably clear that most of the Indians they interacted with, with were servants. Most of the British never bothered to interact with the educated elite. You know? They interacted largely with servants. And if you were even a mid-level official in, in India, a Britisher, you had a whole retinue of servants. Whole retinue of servants. Housekeepers, ayahs, cooks, gardeners. I mean, the viceroy, that's the supreme ruler of India. You know, the viceregal gardens, okay? The viceregal palace, which was built in the early 20th century. And we'll talk about that when we get later on in the course. I mean, if you read accounts of that, 20 people were hired just to chase away the birds from the gardens. I mean, a huge retinue of people, okay? That these the colonial officials had. Right? And these are largely the people they're interacting with. Right? Of course, there are going to be exceptions. There are going to be Englishmen and Englishwomen. I mean, let me be very clear, who are going to be very strong supporters of the nationalist struggle in India. So there's some interaction there, but you're talking about really minuscule number of people there. You know, minuscule. All right? So, uh, British life in India, Vernade, this is an anthology, and we're reading that section called Servants. 40 pages. And then a review by myself uh, of a book, um, you know, on hill stations. Okay? And you're going to start reading this novel by E.M. Forster called A Passage to India. If you haven't seen the film, see it. I think the film is quite interesting too. You know, all these sophisticated critics, as they are called, uh, film critics, panned the film. Uh, but I know what these sophisticated film critics amount to. So I wouldn't worry about it too much if I were you. You know, see the film and don't think ne really of making comparisons. That's always a problem when you go from the book to the film. Usually it's the book to the film. It's very rarely the film to the book. You know, usually there are films which are based on books, but there are very few books which are based on films, you know. Right? But there's always this problem, this transition. Um, so you should view it independently. And obviously there, there's a great deal that will resonate with you if you've read the book and you're not required to obviously see the film. Then we move into the political economy of imperialism. And when I say the political economy here, I'm talking about, well, what, what, you know, what were the economic consequences of British rule in India? What happened to trade? There's an argument that was made, famous argument. Some people dispute it. In 1700, it is argued that India and China and Europe roughly Europe as a whole, India, China, roughly each accounted for one third of the world trade. Okay? Certainly India and China were dominant players. Now some people are arguing that we're going to return to that age now. I'm not so optimistic about it, but that's a different, but we leave that aside. What is certainly very clear is that by early 1900, India had lost the ability even to make, make matchsticks, if I may exaggerate a bit. Okay. Very little industry in India. India is going to account for less than 1% of the global world trade. Right? So what, what happened during this period of time? Right? Um, what is the relationship of such things as the opium wars? Okay? You know, with China. We're going to see the connections there. Right? So we're going to read excerpts um, from a number of works, including Marx. Because Marx wrote a whole bunch of essays on India. Of course, he never went to India, but that's not a problem. That's never been a problem, frankly. I mean, James Miller wrote this huge work. It's called The History of British India. Six volumes. I mean, he never left London. Forget about going to, going to India, you know. But by the way, I'm not being completely ironical because sometimes you may go and then see nothing. And, and that might be a greater problem because then you think you've seen a lot of things and so then you think you have authority. That's a different problem, you know? But there's certainly a problem here that he was an armchair scholar. Uh, but frankly, these essays are brilliant, but, you know, I have a great deal of difficulty with some of the positions that he enunciates, right? 
So that's why we're going to read it, because I think that we need to know what, you know, one of the two or three major figures of the last 150 years in the intellectual horizon thought about India and about what the British were doing in India. And then we're going to get into the last segment of the course, and that has to do with the rebellion of 1857. So again, you know, Metcalf and Metcalf a chapter, Shumit Sarkar, major historian of India, start reading some of his works. Um, so 1857, because the company is going to be abolished, and India will now become what's called a crown colony. It falls directly under British rule, right? Uh, and then we're going to see the emergence of nationalism very gradually. We're going to look at such questions as, well, what was the position of women under these nationalist movements? Why was the woman question, as it's called? Why did that become so important? Why is it that questions having to do with women's reform Okay, women's uplift, the improvement of women in Indian society. Why do these questions become so critical? Why are they the linchpin for many people? For trying to understand the nature of British rule in India, its consequences, and so on, so forth and so on. And then finally, we get into full-blown nationalism and what is called communalism. Communalism is this whole problem, we're going to discuss it at great length, problem of religious conflict in India. And we're going to look at, obviously, the role of Mohandas Gandhi. I teach an entire course on, course on Gandhi, so we're going to really uh, you know, have to encapsulate things, because there's no question in my mind that he is the supreme figure. Um, you know, of course, I mean, I'm well aware of these different kinds of histories, and I'm sympathetic to some of them, which even contest this idea of you know, looking at elite figures of Indian nationalism, but there is absolutely no question that Gandhi is a world historical figure, okay? And that he is indisputably the most important person, uh, not simply in the study of Indian nationalism, but he is a critical figure in world history for many reasons, you know? So we are going to look in particular at, at some of Gandhi's ideas, his role, uh, what was the nature of the struggle, because the nature of the struggle in India was really quite different. The idea of opposing colonial rule with non-mass, non-violent resistance, and this is a unique phenomenon in history. And so I think we need to give it some attention without neglecting the other strands that had their place as well. There were people who were obviously not sold on the idea of Gandhi's, Gandhian nationalism, if we may put it this way. right? So this is the, going to be the shape of the course, and we'll end with obviously some reflections on the partition of India in 1947, when India is going to get split. A new nation state called Pakistan is going to be created. Of, of, obviously, the British uh, leave India or are thrown out of India, depending on how you want to look at it, right? And so we're going to end there roughly in 1947. All right, thank you.